A very warm welcome to you all, interested members of the public and my colleagues in the academy. It is my pleasure to open this, our first symposium of spring 2021 on behalf of my colleagues from the Indian Ocean Working Group Committee, Dr. Rogaya Abushara, Dr. Uday Chandra, Dr. Pirat Puruch, and Dr. Amir Sonbal. Since our establishment in 2014, we in the Indian Ocean Working Group have focused on the Western Indian Ocean. This is because of our strategic location in Georgetown University in Qatar, which is therefore a part of this zone of the Indian Ocean. Not surprisingly, it is also a reflection of the concentration of a majority of Indian Ocean world scholars in this region. However, we have always been cognizant of the vastness of the Indian Ocean world, as well as the multi-directional manner in which its peoples have interacted over a broad span of time, resulting in complex demographic realities of this world today, as well as its rich sociocultural melange. It is with this in mind that we have welcomed participation from scholars focusing on various aspects of Southeast Asia and East Asia to our symposium over the years. Last spring, for example, one of our panelists today, Dr. Hideaki Suzuki, gave a presentation on the role of Japanese entrepreneurs in the textile markets of East Africa and the Asian subcontinent, particularly as it pertains to the famous kanga a cotton fabric worn by many women in East Africa to this day. His presentation highlighted the nuances of the direct interaction between these far ends of the Indian Ocean world in the early 20th century. It is my hope that we will continue to have these intellectual exchanges, be they those that expound on interconnections across vast expanses of the Indian Ocean world, or more regional circularities. And now, let me introduce our moderator, Dr. Anto Moxen of Northwestern University in Qatar. We in the Indian Ocean Working Group value the unique manner in which our setup in Education City facilitates networking between our different universities. Anto is a member of the Indian Ocean Working Group and has participated in a number of our events over the years. Those of you who have been with us for a while will recognize him, if not have met him already. He is a professor in the liberal arts program at Northwestern University in Qatar. He is also affiliated faculty member of Northwestern University Science in Human Culture program in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. Prior to joining Northwestern University in Qatar, he held a Henry Luce postdoctoral fellowship in Asian Environmental Studies at Hobart and William Smith Colleges, where he taught courses on environment and development in Southeast Asia. Moxon's teaching and research interests include environmental studies, energy studies, particularly as they pertain to electricity and disaster studies. He examines topics in these areas using a science and technology studies perspective. Dr. Moxon is currently working on his book manuscript on the socio-political history of electrification in post-independent in Indonesia. The manuscript is tentatively titled Electrifying Indonesia, Electricity, Nation Building and Development After World War II. In this book, he examines the role electricity and electrification play in the, market, in the making and maintenance of Indonesia's nationhood and in the discourse, practices and consequences of its national development project. He promises to be an interesting publication and I'm sure many of us look forward to reading it. Dr. Moxin will now proceed to moderate this webinar 
and introduce the rest of our panelists. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to you all, uh, depending on your location. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Phoebe Musandu, uh, for your kind introduction and for inviting me to moderate this really exciting panel uh, this afternoon, Doha time. Uh, I would also like to thank the Indian Ocean Working Group at Georgetown University in Qatar. It is really nice to uh, have been engaging with this group over the past year since I arrived here to teach at Northwestern University in Qatar in 2015. Uh, please allow me to introduce all of our four panelists in the order that they will deliver their talk this afternoon. Uh, the first one is Dr. R. Michael Fiener. Uh, he's, the he's a professor of humanities at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Kyoto University and an associate member of the history faculty at the University of Oxford. He was formerly a research leader of the Religion and Globalization Research Cluster at the Asia Research Institute, associate professor in the Department of History at the National University of Singapore, and the Sultan of Oman Fellow at the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. He has also taught at Reed College and the University of California, Riverside and held visiting professor positions and research fellowships at several places. He's published extensively in the fields of Islamic studies and Southeast Asian history, as well as on post-disaster reconstruction, religion and development. He is the head of the Maldives Heritage Survey or MHS and the principal investigator and project leader of the Maritime Asia Heritage Survey, which builds on uh, the MHS. The title of his talk today is Between Sea Level and Cyberspace, Source Material, Archive Building, and the Formulation of Research Questions in the Study of Indian Ocean Worlds. He'll critically reflect his experience uh, of the ongoing project on the Maritime Air, Air, uh, Asia Heritage Survey. Our second speaker will be Dr. Tansen Sen, who is the director of the Center for Global Asia, professor of history at NYU Shanghai, and global network professor at NYU. He specializes in Asian history and religions and, and has, has a special scholarly interest in India-China interactions, Indian Ocean connections, and Buddhism. He's the author of Buddhism, Diplomacy, and Trade, and India, China, and the World. He has co-authored with Victor H. Mayer, Traditional China in Asian and World History, and edited the book Buddhism Across Asia. He's currently working on a book about Zhang He's maritime expeditions in the early 15th century and co-editing with Eng Seng Ho, The Cambridge History of the Indian Ocean, Volume 1. He has done extensive research in India, China, Japan, and Singapore with grants from several foundations. He was the founding head of the Nalanda Srivijaya Center in Singapore and served on the governing board of the Nalanda University. The title of his talk is China's Engagement with the Indian Ocean World, in which he'll examine China's historical engagement with the Indian Ocean World, as well as the modern reconstructions of these interactions. Our third speaker will be Dr. Hideaki Suzuki. Dr. Suzuki is Associate Professor at the Department of Globalization and Humanity at the National Museum of Ethnology in Osaka, Japan. His research interests are in the field of history of Western Indian Ocean World, Global History on Abolition of Slavery and Slave Trade, The Pearl Fishery and Bondage in the Persian Gulf. He is the author of Slave Trade Profiteers in the Western Indian Ocean and A Global History of Abolition of Slavery and Slave Trade, um, the second book in Japanese, as well as edited the book Abolition as a Global Experience and World History Viewed from East Asian Kaiki. The second one is also in Japanese. Is currently working on book projects on the history of Western Indian Ocean world in the 19th century and also um, bonded populations in the Persian Gulf in the first half of the 20th century. The title of his talk today is Development of Kaiki Shi um, and its Dilemma. Professor Suzuki will clarify the implications of the translations of Kaiki Shi. Uh, which is uh, translated as history of maritime regions and show the dilemma it faces today. 
Our fourth um, speaker today is Dr. Weixin Gui, who is an associate professor of English and director of Southeast Asian Studies at the University of California, Riverside. He works on post-colonial and global Anglophone literature, particularly from Southeast Asia. He's the author of National Consciousness and Literary Cosmopolitics and co-edited a 2016 special issue of the journal Interventions on Singaporean Literature and Culture and a 2020 special issue of the journal Antipodes on Southeast Asian Literary Connections with Australia and New Zealand. The title of his talk is Contemporary Indian Ocean Writing and Perth's Center for Stories. He'll discuss one of the literary anthologies published by the Perth Center titled Wave After Wave, Writers from the Indian Ocean. Uh, with that, um, the floor is your doctor, yours, Dr. Michael Fiener. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to all of our colleagues in Doha for uh, setting up this event. I'm really grateful for this opportunity to be able to engage some of these topics with some old friends and some new colleagues that I haven't had a chance to discuss these issues with before. And I'm sure that I'm going to learn a lot from today's session. Uh, but to start things off, uh, just let me begin in direct response to the prompt that we were all first set uh, by Dr. Musandu when she was first uh, organizing this event. While we were in correspondence, she explained the origins of this panel as being aimed toward, quote, a broadening of the horizons of our focus beyond the Western Indian Ocean, particularly as it pertains to interactions between Eastern Africa, the Gulf, and South Asia over time, end quote. My own approach, however, has been along a somewhat different vector, reflecting my own current location here in Kyoto and the roots that have brought me here. When I first entered into the Indian Ocean world, it was from the opposite side of the map, through my studies of the history of Muslim societies of the Indonesian archipelago. It was from there that my research questions and personal interests gradually nudged me to work my way westwards towards places like Egypt and Yemen. And then over the decades that followed back and forth across the waters of the Indian Ocean and across the Java Sea, as well as up and down the coasts of East Asia over the past 30 years. I would say that the framework for me then is one in which the Indian Ocean is set within a more extensive maritime world of Southern Asia with significant eastward stretches that have contributed sub substantially to circulations of culture and commerce that have shaped life along the littorals of East Africa, Arabia, India, and the many islands in between. The oceanic imagination of some of the ancient inhabitants of this region were mapped out in terms of seven seas in the cosmological language, for example, of the Vishnu Purana, where we see that this sort of, these seven seas as concentric oceans of salt water, sugar cane juice, wine, ghee, curd, milk, and freshwater, all encircling the inhabited land of Jambudvipa. In the works of medieval Arabic writers, however, this same motif of seven seas was cast in more geographic than symbolic terms, but as segments all within the great green sea, the Bar al Akhtar, or the great Ind ocean of India. And so, for example, in the mid 10th century, the Arab writer Al Masudi enumerated these seven seas more or less in order from west to east as the seas of Fars, Kar, Harkand, Kalabar, Salahit, Kardanj, and Sanji. Uh, much more recently, at the turn of the 21st century, a somewhat analogous perspective of these interlinked oceans has been extensively discussed under the plural rubric of the worlds, with an S, of the Indian Ocean by Philippe Bojard. The two massive volumes of Bojad's magnum opus are structured in a patterned series of chapters that treat a different uh, the set of different periods ranging from the fourth millennium before the common era to the 15th century of our own. And these multiple worlds that get traced over this long chronology by Bojad are organized under the broad rubrics of China, India, West and Central Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia and Madagascar. It's the history of these last worlds, Madagascar, that's Bojard's own field of academic specialization. And it's from this relatively understudied 
history of this somewhat idiosyncratic island that Beaujard has zoomed out to this extensive exploration of the Indian Ocean as a key to the a history of broader processes of state formation, commercial circulations, and cultural exchanges that are all dynamically situated within the progressive integration of an expanding range of world regions and culminating at the end of Beaujard's work in the formation of the first truly global system with the entrance of Europeans into the Indian Ocean world and the opening up of maritime connections to the Americas. Now situated as his work is with a specific tradition of French historiography, Beaujard weaves these diverse strands of global history into a story of the evolution of capitalism and the emergence of a private sector, albeit here one that significantly complicates some of the more familiar forms of such narratives, which are all too often cast in a mode of European triumphalism. For future studies of the Indian Ocean world, however, there are other stories than this to be told. Stories of cultural interactions, cross fertilizations, and the ongoing reconfigurations of conceptions of community and imaginations of the identities of composite selves and others in a complexly and unevenly interconnected world. Conversations on such aspects of regional and global history must by their very nature demand serious engagement simultaneously with a range of different disciplinary perspectives and engage with a really diverse a set of primary source materials. And this is a problem. For despite the repeated calls that we hear to be more interdisciplinary, that is actually far more easily said than done, particularly in the face of constraints on conduits for career advancement that tend to privilege recognition in specific disciplinary departments, and also the lack of incentive structures, uh, incentive structures that are in place for those who might be tempted to risk stretching oneself too far afield. This kind of deep interdisciplinarity can also, quite frankly, be intellectually daunting, as it can require an immense amount of effort even to familiarize yourself with adjacent fields of study to the point where you could be confident to substantially engage in comparative conversations on their own terms. What then can we do to avoid finding ourselves drowning in such a situation? Well, here is where I think Indian Ocean Studies luckily seems to have a remedy relatively close at hand. For scholars like us studying such watery parts of the world, we often need to quite literally get our feet wet. And as any swimmer knows, you should not ever dive into unfamiliar waters alone. Every summer camp scout or young YMCA polywog knows the buddy rule. And over the years, I've been incredibly fortunate in finding a number of intellectual companions with whom I could dip a toe into unfamiliar waters and help me eventually to swim a little bit. And so what I'd like to, to say here is I think we should try and realize that even while developing our own individual research strengths and our publication profiles, we don't always have to go it alone. In attempting to interpret the range of historical human experiences across the diversity of languages, lifeways, cultures, and religions of the region that we study, well-constructed collaborations can be particularly productive. I've learned to appreciate this through my own work together with a number of colleagues specializing in different fields over the years to produce jointly authored publications on topics like South and Southeast Asian history, Buddhist and Islamic religious networks, as well as a number of other topics. And this collaborative work has in turn helped me to shape my own writing and thinking on subsequent sole authored articles and monographs, strengthening both in the process. Most of my own recent work on the Indian Ocean region has focused on the Maldives. This lightly populated archipelago of coral atolls has at various points been home to Buddhist monastic communities, a Muslim Sultanate, a brief Portuguese occupation, as well as in terms of Dutch and British protectorate before the establishment of the modern state in 1968. In other words, the Maldives shares many experiences with societies across the eastern side of the Indian Ocean world, and especially through Southeast Asia, which is where I did most of my uh, earliest research. Now, from the perspective of Doha, the tiny islands of the Maldives might look like the far edge of a Western Indian Ocean frame, 
sharing identifications with Sunni Shafi'i forms of Islam, coral stone material culture, and other historical experiences. Looking at the broader Indian Ocean seascape, the Maldives seem to sit very near the center, but with some of its most robust historical connections being to Sri Lanka and the west coast of India. But the primary factor that directed my own research interest toward the Maldives was in its past connections even further east with Aceh on the northern tip of the Indonesian island of Sumatra. And in the course of my work in the Maldives over recent years, new connections eastward from the Maldives across the Indian Ocean have formed as well, with the arrival in the Maldives of a number of my colleagues from Indonesia who've joined me in the work on a fairly large scale archeological survey and heritage documentation project there. This is the Maritime Asia Heritage Survey that, uh, that Anto just mentioned in my introduction. Um, and so that's where I am now in Kyoto, working with this team in both Indonesia and the Maldives. It's a large team that includes surveyors, photographers, archeologists, historians, database managers, architects, computer graphic specialists, and spatial analysis experts that are all engaged in the in the day to day work of the project. And we're also able to draw on the experience and expertise of an international advisory board of interdisciplinary scholars and professionals from diverse fields. Our primary work over the past three years has been to systematically survey and digitally document the endangered cultural heritage of the Maldives using not only traditional archaeological survey techniques, but also new technologies like photogrammetry, LIDAR, GIS, CAD, 3D modeling, manuscript digitization, and oral history interviews, all to create a new kind of open access and permanently archived source base of archeological and historical source material for this little studied region of the Indian Ocean. Over the coming years, we're also expanding to open up parallel surveys using the same database architecture and the same field methodology in a number of other countries, including Indonesia, Brunei, Vietnam, and Sri Lanka. And so in our work, we're collecting a massive amount of data from diverse sources, and then working to make sure that it's both archived for long-term preservation and made freely accessible online. And in order to do this, we've built up a series of relationships with people in local communities um, where we digitize this source material, and we also spend a lot of work on global outreach efforts that aim to disseminate data. And to disseminate our data, not as the anthropologist Tim Ingold has recently characterized data as the input of the modern knowledge economy, where Ingold kind of talks about data as the raw material that's fed into machines that process it to excrete output. That is quite literally crap, right? Rather, what we've tried to do in our work over the years uh, is more along the lines of correspondence that are congruent with those drawn in Tim Ingold's most recent collection of essays, where it expresses the idea that data can be understood as something given freely to people to help them live and to know. That is, it's more akin then to an organic digestion process as of life and growth than a ruthless and then a kind of ruthless churning through of machine processing. As Ingold puts it, quote, in producing knowledge then, they are also producing themselves as people who know. And so when I recently read this beautifully crafted line, I immediately resonated with something of how my, I have myself tried to formulate, conduct, and continue to explore the work of our project. In our discussions here today, I'd just like to raise for consideration the value of Ingold's vision of correspondences as a framework for developing new scholarship through open-ended and dialogical processes that can facilitate both the presentation of new data for discussion and the generation of knowledge that can be meaningful to those beyond our own particular studies or disciplinary circles of colleagues. As I hope to have shown in this brief introduction to our work on the Maritime Asia Heritage Survey, even with this massive digital data set, the ultimate aim is to produce output not simply of say static maps of something like every carved coral grave gravestone in Lamu Atoll. Now, of course we can easily provide a map of that material 
And that kind of information presented in such forms can indeed be useful for some, say, catalogers of epigraphic inscriptions or government heritage management officers. But while our work enables such utilitarian access to data, the overarching goal of our work is really something different, to assemble, preserve, and freely share a body of empirical material that can be dynamically engaged by anyone looking for resources to help them explore in new ways, either the place that they call home or the homes of others a world away. Our data then can be brought to bear on broader human questions, like where people might choose to live and what might make them move, or how communities respond to environmental distress, or how they respond to social transformations like religious change, or how cultures develop uh, responses to the in inevitability of death. We work a lot in cemeteries. And so our work on archeological and historical documentation can be viewed in the service uh, in the service of supporting more hermeneutic work of multiple and diverse fields beyond say just archeology span or even history proper. Fields such as those which Clifford Geertz once described as being quote, absorbed with the artisan task of seeing broad principles in parochial facts, end quote. In some, I think the healthy future development of Indian Ocean studies requires both richer empirical data and new thoughtful questions being formulated to frame its interpretation. And I would argue that exploring new modes of collegial collaboration can go a long way toward helping us on both fronts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. It's really uh, a nice talk that I'm sure many of uh, in, in our audience will uh, have questions about uh, and we'll address it in the question and answer sessions later on. Uh, our, next speaker, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tansen Sen. Uh, the floor is yours. We, I, I, I joined Michael in, in thanking all of you uh, in, in Doha. Uh, and I think we had planned to meet uh, up in Qatar, uh, but that didn't take place, but hopefully in, in the future we'll be doing that. But uh, today is uh, New Year's Eve in, in China. It's the Chinese New Year uh, tomorrow. So I wish you Happy New Year from Shanghai. Uh, and I would like to present uh, 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 China's engagement with, it, with the Indian Ocean uh, from three perspectives. One. Uh, is about uh, China's uh, historical interactions with the maritime world, the Indian Ocean world. Um, but then the reconstruction of that history uh, later on, especially from the 20th century onwards, uh, and how Chinese scholars uh, in, in the mainland have looked at those historical connections uh, and have formulated their perception of those interactions, uh, and especially given uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, new kinds of histories are being written uh, about China's engagement with the Indian Ocean world. Um, and uh, finally, I would, uh, uh, similar to what Michael has done, uh, try to emphasize some of the collaborations that we are doing from our center. Uh, and I think Phoebe has distributed the link to our center in Shanghai uh, and the projects that we are doing it. And again, following uh, Michael, uh, collaborative research is the key. I agree with, with him uh, as well. Uh, so let me start with the historical issues related to China's engagement and again China broadly defined uh, and then we see this quite early that uh, directly or indirectly uh, the inland areas the hinterland areas of, of, of China were linked to various parts of the Indian Ocean we see this from uh, archaeological findings regarding cowries uh, that were coming from the area that Michael works on uh, and, and entering China hinterland areas through India and, and Burma. And I think these are fascinating connections. We forget that these are actually very tight connections uh, that end up in the hinterland area. So that dates back to pretty early 
uh, before common era, uh, but clearly by the middle uh, centuries of, of uh, common era, we find various kinds of other objects coming from Afghanistan, South Asia, through Southeast Asia into the southern parts of what is present the People's Republic of China. Uh, and then these are mostly precious and semi-precious stones uh, that, are, that are entering. So we see different kinds of objects uh, coming into China from the maritime areas of the, of the Indian Ocean world. Uh, now, at that time, uh, I don't think uh, there was uh, an active Chinese participation uh, into the Indian Ocean world other than people perhaps who are called the Yue people in the southern part of China, uh, engaging with Southeast Asia and, and so forth. Um, uh, these kinds of maritime interactions really take off during the first millennium CE, uh, when we find uh, not only traders coming from different parts of, of Asia or the Indian Ocean world to the coastal regions of China, but also some kind of interactions uh, focused on, on southern part of China and Southeast Asia. Uh, and then we see by the middle of the first millennium CE, uh, various kinds of Buddhist monks arriving uh, from South Asia through the maritime channels into, into China and, and then going into different sites uh, within China. And then clearly there is this engagement between uh, the Buddhist network and, and the commercial networks uh, that are taking place. Monks are being ferried by uh, uh, ships belonging to various traders. And it's not only men who are traveling, we see uh, records of female uh, nuns traveling as well from, from Sri Lanka and other places. So it's not a male gendered traveling that is taking place. I think we forget in the part of Indian Ocean Studies, uh, there is a, a female component that, that miss, gets missed out uh, in, in these, these connections. Um, uh, what we find perhaps by the end of the first millennium CE, a more active engagement by Chinese traders uh, going into the maritime world, particularly starting with Southeast Asia, uh, but uh, beginning of the second millennium CE with the development of Chinese shipbuilding technology. Now the Chinese ships uh, gradually start dominating uh, the maritime connections all the way from coastal China to, to at least South Asia. Uh, and this is happening around the 12th, 13th century CE, uh, what is the Song Dynasty. Uh, and, and that peaks with the early uh, 15th century voyages of uh, the Chinese Admiral uh, uh, Chengke. Uh, I'm working on, on him and his voyages. Uh, and, and we see that uh, at that point in the early 15th century, Chinese ships are perhaps the most uh, powerful uh, ships in the world uh, that are going across the Indian Ocean uh, world. Uh, what they are doing, and this is pretty important, and, and uh, one of my studies is about uh, what happens on the ships. Uh, I, I call it floating cosmopolitanism, and it's really fascinating to see the kinds of exchanges that take place on the maritime world and not in the coastal regions. I think that's, that's important to also, also look at. Uh, but by 15th century, we find uh, Chinese maritime engagement uh, peaking, uh, but also soon after that declining because of the maritime ban that is instituted in the Ming uh, dynasty. And, and then we see a gradual decline all the way to the Opium War, when clearly we see that uh, the Chinese ships are no longer as powerful as they used to be uh, in the early 15th century. Uh, so this is a general overview of, of perhaps China's maritime historical engagement uh, starting perhaps from uh, before the common era all the way to the early 15th century. Uh, the Opium War marks a very important uh, transition in the study of the maritime world. Suddenly the Chinese realized that the maritime world is actually a threat. Uh, and, and, and that's why it becomes important for them to acquire knowledge about the maritime world. So we find uh, for the first time more research being done uh, on what's happening in Indonesia, for example, what the Dutch are doing there, uh, what the British are doing in India and, and so forth. The information collection uh, becomes quite important. Uh, and then this is where my second uh, aspect of, of China's engagement uh, with the Indian Ocean world begins is the understanding of the Indian Ocean world. Uh, it's not necessarily engagement by traveling to the Indian Ocean world. Uh, so one of the very famous Chinese intellectuals in 1904, uh, writes this very influential article uh, about uh, Chengha, uh, comparing Chengha to Christopher Columbus uh, and uh, setting the stage for how Chengha is then perceived in, in mainland China. Uh, he is not a warmonger, he argues, he, uh, unlike Christopher Columbus, who ends up colonizing 
uh, the new, new places they discover in, in Americas. Uh, but uh, Cheng He as a diplomat, as a, uh, as a peace uh, uh, diplomat from, uh, from China going into the Indian Ocean world. Uh, his article in 1904 then, then sets the stage of involving Cheng He as one of the key figures in China's historical engagement uh, with the Indian Ocean world. And then since then, studies have, have all followed uh, uh, Liang Qixiao's uh, description of, of, of Cheng He. One very important thing also happens uh, in the 20th century, early 20th century, uh, is uh, then the engagement with the overseas Chinese population. They also become part of what we can perhaps say the Chinese maritime heritage, uh, having networks not only with the Chinese overseas in Southeast Asia, but uh, other places, including South, South Asia. Uh, and, and that becomes part of uh, the historical interactions that is gradually becoming the heritage of Chinese uh, Indian Ocean engagements, it seems. Um, there's a period from around 1949 when the PRC is established to around uh, 1978 when many political issues are taking place within China, including the Cultural Revolution. Uh, people have called this a sluggish period for the Chinese study of the Indian Ocean world. Nothing much gets produced. Much of the work on the Indian Ocean is done in Taiwan or, or in Hong Kong. Uh, and it is after 77, and this relates to uh, the opening up that takes place in China, the, the reform movement that is taking place with the special economic zones, uh, that creates another way in which China starts engaging with the, uh, with the Indian Ocean world, bringing back what Liang Qixiao had said in 1904, saying that we had a long history with, uh, with, with, with the Indian Ocean and we should revive it. Uh, and I see uh, in, in the 1980s in particular, this maritime heritage of China being asserted uh, and asserted in a way that is very much with uh, what Prasenjit Dwara has talked about, uh, giving uh, this historical narrative, a nation state framework. It's all China and China had a 5,000 years of history uh, and the Indian Ocean engagement is also 5,000 years old. Uh, there are of course problems with that. Uh, this is also the time when uh, this term uh, maritime Silk Road uh, actually gets incorporated in the vocabulary of, of the Chinese. Uh, in fact, uh, there's also a term called the 20th century maritime Silk Road uh, that has been used uh, by, uh, by various kinds of intellectuals uh, in, in China trying to be pro-reform movement. Uh, the discourse has been how fast should China open up and some of these intellectuals and politicians use the Chinese heritage, uh, maritime heritage and say that we, we have been open uh, and we should continue to be open. Uh, so this, this stage of studying uh, Chinese maritime heritage and bringing in again, the overseas Chinese uh, as part of that heritage becomes very, very important uh, way of looking at China's engagement with the Indian Ocean world. Uh, the other stage that happens is the more recent one uh, from 2013 onwards, uh, when uh, Xi Jinping talks about the Belt and Road Initiative, that really gives uh, a huge impetus to the study of the Indian Ocean World. Um, and, and hundreds of books are being written uh, on, on this uh, initiative and China's engagement with the Indian Ocean World. Uh, there are about 300 and, and the center that I, I work for uh, has been compiling a database on these kinds of studies uh, in, the, in the past uh, five, six years. Uh, and it's amazing the kind of literature that has come in from the, from, from the mainland uh, China. Uh, and, and so this again has given a, a very important impetus to study and engage with the Indian Ocean world in, in mainland China. So I would say this is uh, another stage of studying the Indian Ocean world uh, in, in the mainland uh, area. Uh, I'll just end with uh, what our center has been doing, uh, just like what, uh, uh, what Michael did for his project. Uh, for the last three years, uh, we have funding from the Henry Luce Foundation. We have been looking at how port cities work in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and, and we call this Indian Ocean world, uh, which extends all the way to Japan. Um, and looking at port cities, uh, how they work internally and how they interact externally. Uh, and, and we are trying to develop uh, a way in which to expand that to coastal areas and looking at how uh, environment uh, is an issue with the development project projects that relates to various 
uh, uh, countries now installing in the coastal regions, especially in India, uh, but also with the Belt and Road Initiative, what is the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative on the coastal regions? So essentially bringing a historical angle to it, an anthropological angle to it, and an environmental angle to it, uh, to study the recent impact of development on port cities uh, and, and coastal areas. Uh, and finally, one other project uh, that we are doing since we are based in, uh, in China, we are collecting information about Chinese sources on the Indian Ocean world. Uh, these are of course Chinese writings and trying to create a database about what's there in Chinese language source material about Africa, about South Asia, about South Southeast Asia, including what kind of archeological uh, data there is uh, that perhaps scholars interested in, uh, in doing research on Indian Ocean could use. Uh, many of these sources have not been translated, but it would be good to have that database. And, and then uh, hopefully the collaboration that Michael uh, is talking about, we have been discussing uh, with Michael, how we can bring what he is doing and what we are doing together. And I would be happy to listen to what others have uh, been doing in, in Doha, for example, and, and how perhaps we can collaborate with other uh, groups uh, interested in the Indian Ocean world. I would end with that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Tansen. And thank you also for reminding us about the uh, Chinese uh, New Year, Ching uh, Kuala. Uh, Gong Si Fa Chai. And it uh, looks like uh, Michael will uh, have a new uh, body rule here, uh, potentially, uh, in his project. Uh, we we know each other for a long time. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, That's we great. Go way back. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful to know. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. Hideaki Suzuki. The floor is yours. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> well, so uh, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. And I'm going to talk about uh, Kaiki Sea studies in Japan. Uh, as, I, as I will talk, talk, I mean, the Kaiki Sea study is a basic uh, uh, framework of the uh, Japanese scholar, a Japanese historian try to capture the maritime history. So, uh, but the, anyway, Kaiki Shi should sound strange to many of you. It is a Japanese term and this can be taken into three pieces like a kai, iki, and shi. Each meaning is shown on a slide. So combination of these uh, components, we tend to understand kai, ki, shi is a Japanese version of maritime history or history of uh, mar uh, maritime region. Actually, some of Japanese scholars do translate like, like that. However, I do not agree with any of these uh, uh, translation. Easy translation leaves original implication of the term. So what are the implications of kaikishi? It largely aims at first taking ocean and seas into historical perspective. And then secondly, from that perspective, perspective, trying to create new paradigm of our understanding of history, particularly world history. The basic understanding of world history in a Japanese society is largely influenced by world history as a subject in a high school. Because world history is a required subject, which means all the students need to learn, and the rate of enrollment in high school is almost like 99%. And the high school textbook are uh, written by mostly university professors. So this textbook is a kind of medium to connect academia and the public. And this is the basic model of world history in Japan. I mean, these uh, land-based uh, regions exists individually since ancient time to the present. And since the 16th century onwards, European expansion split it all over the world and integrated these individual regions. So regarding this model, world history is a kind of jigsaw puzzle of regional histories. 
each region has a certain boundary to distinguish itself from others. The Kaikishi emerges in conjunction of maritime perspective with criticism of this sort of conventional understanding and then try to create some new possibility to capture the history of this globe. As I mentioned later, emergence of Kaikishi was in the 1980s to the 1990s. However, in Japanese academia, maritime perspective or studies on maritime activities do exist for a long time. So here I like to explain briefly development, how maritime perspective met criticism of world history and then Kaikishi emerged. We can find out three so-called ancestor fields of Kaikishi even in a pre-war period. One is the history of the Japan foreign relations. Uh, the University of Tokyo's Historiographical Institute, which still exists, has edited huge number of volumes on this, on this subject, including edition and then translation of diaries of Dutch East India Company's factory in Dejima, uh, Nagasaki, or Jesuit missionary records on Japan. And secondly, history of Southern Sea. This is a uh, really uh, imperial product originated in Taihoku Imperial University in uh, Taiwan. A geographically, history of Southern Sea includes Southeast Asia, Oceania, and sometimes India. And it has been largely criticized in a post-war Japan for many years as something deeply embedded in a Japanese imperial policy. However, it is certain that it is, I mean, these are true, uh, but it is certain that it is in this field that the studies on the Southeast Asian history and then also history of Oceania studied in Japan. And lastly, East-West relations. Usually major geographical area of this field is so-called Silk Road or Central Asia, but gradually it extends towards the sea and the several important works which still refer today appeared in the pre-war period. Uh, in short, these are fields more connect, uh, concerning connectedness in a history. And then after the war, I mean, after 1945, all of these three ancestors declined under huge criticism of Japanese imperialism. Also, there seems no place for them under strong current of historical materialism. And it is in the 1980s that gradually monographs looking at maritime connectedness appeared. And these works uh, show effectively how connectedness beyond the boundary of nation states or conventional land-based regions influenced national history or regional history and straight, uh, uh, stimulated the reader to look history from maritime sphere. First two books uh, locate Japan in the East Asian Kaiki world. The third one by uh, Takeshi Hamashita reconsiders modern age of China, not in the context of Western impact, but in the context of East Asian Kaiki system. And the last one uh, discusses the medieval Indian notion Kaiki world. Significant difference from Ancestor is the ARIA works did not intend to challenge conventional framework of world history and remind, remind themselves in the periphery of uh, historical studies in general. These new works challenges to shift maritime sphere from periphery of historical studies to center. Here I find out the emergence of Kaikishi uh, studies. As a background of the, uh, the emergence of this new trend, partly decline of historical materialism following collapse of social states in the late 80s to the early 90s. And then also simultaneously, it was a period when globalization came to be more visible in Japanese society. Uh, following these monographs, several multi-volume series on the maritime perspective appeared in the 1990s and then early 20s, uh, early 2000s. In other words, Kaikishi more clearly emerged and settled its position in historical studies in Japan and then gradually maritime perspective influenced gradual under, uh, general understanding of world history. 
for, exa for example, more maritime related uh, issues are included in a high school textbook. And in last 15 years or so, Kaikishi further settled its position. It's almost simultaneous to emergence of global history in Japan. More historians recognize the limit of conventional jigsaw puzzles of land-based histories, which are enclosed with boundaries. Historians are more concerning the movement of people, merchandise, thought, or money, which jumped across political borders, and then connected, connectedness came to be a, a, a keyword. And then Kaikishi is one of the most suitable frameworks to explore these movements and then connectedness. And then also in last 15 years, two major publications accelerated Kaikishi. And this is a kind of handbook which explored historiographies of various import, important topics of Kaikishi studies, uh, particularly relating to Asian waters. It has 25 chapters covering the 9th to the 19th century. And the other one is this. This is a result of one very big Kaikishi related project focusing on East Asian waters. It is a complete history of East Asian uh, Kaiki, uh, East Asian Kaiki for general readers. A unique point of this book is that it was co-authored by more than 30 scholars, and many of them are currently major figures on the Kaikishi studies. I found these works represent uh, establishment of Kaikishi studies. In a sense, with these introductory references, it can be said that Kaikishi is now institu in institutionalized. And these are publications in the last 15 years or so on a Kaikishi studies. Of course, there are many more publications which I couldn't show here, not only about East Asian Kaiki, but also Southeast Asian Kaiki, in the Indian Ocean Kaiki. And right now, several people are working on Atlantic or Mediterranean or even Baltic Sea Kaikishi studies. So now I'm going to close my presentation. Uh, at this moment, it's fair to say that Kaikishi dissolves existing boundaries of current uh, components of world history, and it provides a strong alternative to land-based perspective of history. If we go back to this picture, maritime perspective, which Kaikishi provides, certainly breaks through and connect different components of world history, something like uh, this or something like uh, that. With maritime perspective, certainly conventional land-centered history is shaken and is largely reconsidered now. However, if we go forward this direction, I mean emphasizing maritime connection and demanding reconsideration of land-centered history, I'm sure this has certain significance against land-based history, but simultaneously, Kaikishi can to be ocean-centered history. I'm wondering whether this is what Kaikishi is fundamentally looking for or not, or is it really new paradigm? In addition, now very sophisticated introductory references are available. In other words, institutionalization is going on. This seems to be very good things for those who work on a Kaikishi, including me. But at the same time, we need to be careful about the fact such institutionalization creates border of Kaikishi. If Kaikishi limits its scope only on water and port town, what Kaikishi doing is eventually to create missing pieces for jigsaw puzzle like world history. I mean, it might be East Asian Kaiki or Indian Kaiki will be on the on this list of uh, regional components of a uh, world history. I'm afraid that Kaikishi is making these new pieces. What I'm struggling now is these dilemmas, and probably a clue is how to answer the question whether maritime perspective limits its scope only on a water and a port town or not. In other words, how we can extend our scope of maritime perspective beyond the shoreline 
it would be a key to solve th these dilemmas or explore the potential of kaikishi. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, Hideaki Suzuki, thank you. Um, I would like to remind the audience, uh, if you have any questions uh, directed to any of the panelists or all the panelists, uh, please type that in the chat sections. Uh, we'll collect them and then we'll address them during the Q&A sessions after um, our last speaker for today, Dr. Wei Shin Kui, uh, uh, deliver his talk. Uh, so I've been saying the floor is yours. Actually, it's like the Zoom virtual space is yours now. Thank you, Anto. Uh, I uh, would like to thank you and Phoebe Musandu and the conveners of the Indian Ocean Working Group uh, for this opportunity to share my work. And I will now share my screen. Okay, uh, as I begin my talk, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the University of California at Riverside, where I work, is located on the traditional lands of the Kawia, Tungva, Yusenyo, and Serrano peoples. And my talk today is a bit different from those of my fellow panelists, as I'm engaging with Indian Ocean literature studies rather than history. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about a non-profit literary arts and cultural organization called the Centre for Stories, which is located in Perth in Western Australia on the very southeastern edge of the Indian Ocean Rim. And it might seem strange to talk about an Australian organization in a webinar about East and Southeast Asia in uh, Indian Ocean Studies, but let me explain the connection. The Center for Stories was founded in 2015 with the purpose of promoting both oral and written storytelling to inspire social cohesion and to improve understanding of diverse communities in Western Australia. One of the center's co-founders, Caroline Wood, and the center's creative director, Robert Wood, have personal family connections to Singapore and also to Southern India. More importantly, several of the center's projects are designed to mentor and to train individuals in Western Australia who have connections to Indian Ocean countries and cultures. For example, as you can see on the slide, the center's mentorship for writers of African heritage resulted in a short fiction anthology called Ways of Being Here, published in 2017. Its 2019 Saga Sisterhood project focused on live storytelling by South Asian women who had no performance background. Its Indian Ocean Writers Mentoring Project involved participants all the way from Mauritius to Malaysia and produced a 2019 anthology called Wave After Wave. And just this year in 2021, the center launched Portside Review, a journal dedicated to Indian Ocean writing with editorial board members from Australia, Singapore, and India. So the Center for Stories has been engaging with communities from Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Eastern and Southern Africa, pretty much the wide arc of the uh, Indian Ocean. My point in highlighting uh, the Center's storytelling and literary projects is because I think it contributes and helps us to rethink the subfield of Indian Ocean literature studies. Uh, two important critics, Isabel Hoffmeyer and Max Samuelson, have written groundbreaking articles in this subfield. And Isabel Hoffmeyer has coined what she calls an informal canon of Indian Ocean fiction that includes works by uh, Joseph Conrad, Amitav Ghosh, Abdul Raza Gurna, and Lindsay Collin. And what strikes me right, about this uh, informal canon of Indian Ocean texts is that they are mostly single authored novels with Amitav Ghosh's historical novels uh, being studied most often right, uh, as paradigmatic Indian Ocean fiction. In fact, back in July 2020, in an earlier webinar on Indian Ocean humanities, uh, Vilashini Kupan mentioned that there's a move to degoshify right, Indian Ocean literature studies and to look at a wider range of writers, languages, and genres. And here I confess my own limitations. I work primarily on English language or Anglophone literatures, so I'm unable to discuss texts written in other Indian Ocean languages. But what I can offer is an idea, namely that the literary anthology 
such as those published by the Center for Stories, might be a form or a genre suited to new directions in Indian Ocean humanities, perhaps even more suitable than the novel. To return to Vilashini Kupan's talk from last year, right, she mentioned three gestures to think through Indian Ocean humanities, looking out to map relational networks of connection and difference, looking back at our methodologies that historicize and compare concepts and categories and objects, and then looking in at different kinds of memories containing that which isn't immediately visible or sensible. And I think that contemporary literary anthologies by Indian Ocean writers about Indian, uh, Indian Ocean topics can perform all three gestures at once. While a lot of scholarship about literary anthologies centers on their usefulness as teaching tools, right? Think, for example, of the Norton Anthology of Literature used in many college literature survey courses. Recent developments in anthology studies have something else to say. As critics like Barbara Benedict have shown, English literary anthologies from the, uh, from the early modern period uh, to the 18th century were often described by their publishers and readers using metaphors of either a floral bouquet, right, a carefully arranged bunch of flowers, or that of a banquet or a feast. So in its early stages, anthologies were thought of as ornamental or decorative, like a bouquet of flowers, or as food to be consumed, like a multi-course meal or banquet. But when we shift to more contemporary and post-colonial contexts, the cultural politics and critical value of anthologies become clearer. In an essay about Pacific Island poetry networks, Craig Santos Perez, who is a poet from Guam, coins the phrase reading anthologically to describe his encounter with earlier Pacific Island poetry anthologies and how they inspired him to begin weaving his own voice, his own perspective and experience into a Pacific literary genealogy inherited through the anthology. Moreover, reading anthologically also gave Perez permission to explore diverse aesthetics, knowing that there is no single style that defines Pacific literature. And instead of the older metaphor of flowers or a bouquet or a feast or banquet, Perez says that anthologies are maps of the new Oceania and vessels upon which readers can imaginatively journey across and learn about the region. So in an act of inter-oceanic borrowing, I'm proposing that Perez's Pacific Island metaphors of anthologies as maps and as vessels or ships can help us better understand the Indian Ocean world through literary anthologies, because these metaf uh, metaphors seem to perform all three gestures of looking out, back, and in that Vilashini Kupan mentioned. An anthology like the Center for Stories Wave After Wave, which I'll discuss in the last part of my talk, contains not only authors from different Indian Ocean countries like Mauritius, Sri Lanka, India, Malaysia, and Singapore, it also contains different kinds or styles of writing, fiction, memoir, poetry, right, that perform different types of memory work and cultural representation. Furthermore, the diversity of written pieces in an anthology means that we as readers are invited to perform acts of comparison, to intuit relations of connection and difference between the pieces, and to use Perez's terms, weave our own perspectives into those offered by a varied group of authors, precisely because an anthology does not set out to have a unified aesthetic or a single voice. So reading anthologically means making a virtue out of a literary anthology's apparently incompleteness. By this, I mean that an anthology's parts can add to each other, but not always add up to a coherent or co cohesive whole, uh, and that it might make it suitable for mapping the Indian Ocean, which as a region is also sometimes described in similarly cumulative but incomplete terms. And based on my research so far, there's only one earlier English language anthology, Songs from the Seashore, an anthology of poetry from the Indian Ocean Rim that was published in 2014 in India. And that's why I'm interested in more recent anthologies published by the Center for Stories that envision the Indian Ocean. I turn now to the Center's 2019 anthology, Wave After Wave, Writers from the Indian Ocean. 
In the words of editor Robert Wood, the anthology tries to imagine, quote, other forms of belonging aside from the nation state, belongings that run in parallel and sometimes cross over and into others. And this is exactly the kinds of relational networks that can emerge from looking out at the Indian Ocean. The stories, essays, and life writing in this anthology are as much about contemporary life and events as they are about heritage and history, which marks a temporality different from the largely historical novels in the informal canon of Indian Ocean fiction. Here is also the act of looking back, the comparison of present and past. And the notion of looking in or inwards is conveyed in Robert Wood's assertion that, quote, the Indian Ocean offers up our own ways of making sense with our own rhythms and the logics and music and winds, right? These are the various aesthetic or, art or artistic strategies the anthology's writers use to make sense of what cannot be easily or immediately discerned in terms of memory and experience. And in closing, I want to briefly discuss the final piece in this anthology that has a distinctly Southeast Asian connection. So the anthology ends with Rahanati uh, Jalil's creative nonfiction piece titled Gaming the Skin, which is like a mini anthology in itself because it is made up of five separate episodes of vignettes drawn from the author's life experiences. Most of the episodes are set in Perth in Australia, but Rahanati explains that her parents are Indonesian, she was born in Malaysia, and uh, the entire family immigrated to Perth when she was a child and that she, as a practicing Muslim, wears the hijab or headscarf in public. And this last detail causes her to be singled out for Islamophobic attacks in Australia, which she has sadly learned to ignore or become numb to. I find Rahanati's piece interesting because even as it focuses on her contemporary experiences with race, uh, Australian racism, her presence is a reminder of the close historical connection Australia has with Indonesia and Malaysia in terms of geography and culture. Also, Raihanati's friendships in Perth with other Muslim women from as nearby as Singapore and as far away as Palestine is a reminder of the movement of Islam as both religion and culture across the Indian Ocean's expanse. But these are topics that have already been covered in other historical studies of the Indian Ocean world. What I think Rahanati's piece adds to the literary conversation about the Indian Ocean comes from the title of her piece, Gaming the Skin. So in the first episode, right, she and her cousin, who both speak fluent English, pretend to be inarticulate Indonesians when they're questioned by Australian immigration officers. As Rahanati says, quote, it was the first time she had bent the rules in the game of skin even though it means they are being detained for 30 minutes as they are questioned and their luggage is searched. This act doesn't seem to make sense at the beginning of Rahanati's piece, but after we read the other racist incidents she encounters in the middle episodes, the last episode, uh, which flashes back to the airport encounter, begins to make more sense. It is precisely because Rahanati and her cousin know that even though their passports and their accents are Australian, as Muslim women, they will inevitably suffer additional questioning and luggage searches. That is why they decide to, quote, pretend they can't speak English, to poke silent fun at the Australian immigration officers. As Raihanati thinks to herself as she approaches the counter, quote, so in spite of being underdogs in the game of skin, we found an edge. Using the assumptions we had to grin and bear out to, advantage, uh, to bear to our advantage. It is precisely this kind of looking or hearing inward, representing a psychological resistance that can't be seen by the naked eye or heard by the naked ear, that Raihanati's life writing presents at the end. She and her cousin used a particular rhythm of so-called broken English and the counterintuitive logic of pretending to be more foreign than they actually are to win a small moral victory over Australia's institutional racism. Reading anthologically, the small acts of resistance throughout uh, Rahanati's episodic life writing add to each other, but they may not add up to a dramatic or systemic challenge to racism. 
Yet their juxtaposition allows readers to map contemporary racism against a longer and broader sweep of histories, connections, and differences that Raihanati's writing gestures towards, both with Southeast Asia and the larger Indian Ocean world. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much to all of our four panelists. Um, I think now it's a very good time to open our webinar this afternoon for questions and answer sessions. I already am seeing one question so far um, uh, written in the uh, chat. And again, I encourage uh, uh, anyone who has any questions to please uh, write uh, his or her question, or you can also raise your hand. Um, one uh, question, I, I thought I uh, start with this. Uh, initially, I was thinking of mentioning uh, some new things that I learned from all the talks, this, this exciting uh, potential future directions of uh, Southeast and East Asian studies in Indian Ocean world. But let's uh, hear the question from uh, someone who's joining us from Perth here. Um, we are indeed in need of in-depth survey in these parts of the Indian Ocean world where a lot of materials and heritage are still hidden. My question is regarding the time frame, the survey materials will be available and accessible for public. Sometimes good websites stay only for a few years. How will you sustain the public accessibility to those materials? Uh, many thanks. I think this particular question is directed to um, Michael. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the excellent question. This is actually, of course, has been one of the most sort of pressing problems for work in the digital humanities over the past two decades as people have tried to find their feet and many great projects have come up, put all the stuff online and it's become inaccessible or in formats that you can't get a hold of. And so what we uh, did in our project is to work from the very beginning to try to build in sort of mechanisms for, for two things for open access accessibility and for long-term, if not close to permanent preservation. And in this, we've been very fortunate that our work in the Maldives and on the broader survey is supported by the Arcadia Fund uh, based in the UK. And Ar Arcadia has a very, very strong commitment to open access. It's a major sort of defining feature of all of their work. And they are very concerned in making sure that anyone who receives grant money from them is able to provide long-term storage uh, and accessibility for the data collected. And so uh, for the current project, we have everything uh, up uh, now on the Kyoto University servers. And that's where more information will be regularly updated as our project moves on. Every year, uh, according to our project design, we take the entire batch of materials and archive them both in the library system of Kyoto University uh, and at the University of Oxford, where I'm associate member of the history faculty. And so I'm able to deposit this in something called the Oxford Research Archive, which is a special project under the Bodleian Library that uh, maintains uh, long-term near permanent preservation of digital data there. And so we have online uh, everything fully interactive, open access on our website. Kyoto University has agreed to help us to maintain that over the long-term. Um, and even well after the project is over, there will be a permanent archive of this in two mirrored or, or two separate but uh, uh, identical long-term storage archives in Japan, in Kyoto University and in Oxford. And there the information is stored not just in the original format for the database, which is what we use Arches right now, but every single record has its own PDF in a much more sort of durable format. So you could pull up every single individual record as well as all the photographs, the point clouds from our LIDAR scan, um, the videos, the digitized manuscripts with the IIIF format, all of that stuff is permanently archived. And so we've taken, uh, I think, pretty extensive steps to make sure that not only will this be something that people can get a hold of now, uh, but there are at least two options for long-term stability and we're hoping at least one of the two of Oxford or, or Kyoto will still be around for some time to come. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any raised hands from our attendees, not just yet, but I, I do uh, see raised hands from our panelists. 
So uh, go ahead, I'll allow Tansen. Uh, perhaps you had something to ask or something to share. Yeah, I, I actually wanted uh, to ask a question to Professor Hideki Suzuki. Um, so uh, I've been looking at this origin of the term uh, maritime Silk Road, uh, and I've been looking at the, the writings of Misugi Takatoshi, uh, who in uh, 1968, 69, started writing books on, uh, uh, on, on this maritime Silk Road. Uh, and his studies are, are on ceramics, uh, mostly. Um, and, and, and these studies are very much China-centric studies of the Indian Ocean rather than uh, bringing Indian o uh, Japan into the, the context. Um, so what do you think about uh, people, scholars like him, whose work on the Indian Ocean from Japan is, is mostly based on either Chinese sources uh, or Chinese objects? Uh, and, and so this is before the period you were talking about 1980s. This is uh, 68 to 70s that, that we see this. Uh, that's my first question. The second is, what do you see the role of UNESCO? Uh, because UNESCO does two uh, important projects. One is the early 1950s, 57, 58 uh, project on East-West connections, uh, part of their major project. And then in the 80s from 87 uh, to 88 to 97, uh, the Silk Roads project. Uh, and Japan was very much involved in both these projects. Uh, so uh, do you see an impact of UNESCO's projects on the development of the study of the Indian Ocean? It of course did the, the overland, but do you see that playing an important role in the study of the Indian Ocean world? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> that's a very wonderful question. Uh, yeah, I regard, I mean, yeah, the most of the scholars, uh, the, the Arya scholars, like before 80s, or even still today, and many of people who are working on the Indian Ocean world, I mean, including the East Asian Sea and the Southeast East Asian Sea, people can use uh, Chinese materials and then the, uh, also, I mean, uh, Chinese writings. But uh, the significant difference from uh, uh, Misugi's time, who used the term Maritime Silk Road, because, I mean, People, the kaiki understanding of kaikishi kaiki is more like a, a dimensional uh, sphere. It's not like a line uh, from point to point. But rather than that, what kaiki people try to emphasize is try to create a new sphere of the history, which we can find out some. Uh, 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 connection which were ignored for so many decades by uh, these Arya scholars. So in that case, I, yeah, actually, yeah, Misugi would be one of the ancestors of the Kaikishi studies, but I regard such kind of like a point-to-point -point connecting, connection, and this, I, I, such kind of idea I find, it's slightly different from a, 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 a Kaikishi studies. And as for the uh, UNESCO's role, yeah, I know uh, East-West uh, relationship and the RE uh, in the 60s. Was it 60s? Then? In 57, there was a conference, I think, uh, in Kyoto uh, on, on uh, it, it's a very good booklet that was produced on the state of the field of, of maritime and other uh, root studies. Uh, I think it starts from 57. Yeah, probably, I mean, that might influence these uh, maritime uh, the I, the concept of maritime silk road at that time uh, used by a uh, misugi or something and but uh, later on i mean the more recent scholars criticized the concept of the uh, maritime silk road as i explained earlier and then i couldn't find out so strong influence of the unesco into the kaichi studies I don't know the reason why, but uh, I couldn't find any significant role or in, any significant remark by uh, uh, Kaichi scholars on a UNESCO. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael, go ahead. 
Yes, I, I, I'm sorry to, to jump on the same conversation here with, uh, with Professor Suzuki, but I really enjoyed your presentation a lot. In fact, it was one of Yajima's works that was one of the first things I read on the Maldives back in the day, right? His edition of this Arabic Chronicle of the Maldives was one of the first things that I ever really read seriously on the country uh, when I was starting up uh, work towards this project. So I, I really enjoyed it, the, the, big, the bigger genealogy that you have here. And I was especially uh, sort of grateful to hear this uh, insertion, this critical insertion into the conversation about the dangers, guarding against the dangers of somehow ocean history creating these kinds of new boundaries where suddenly the land is kicked out, right? That you could in a sense have an overcorrection of the long reigning problem of landlubber history. And I think it's something that's really important for us to all uh, keep in mind because the tables had been sort of so switched for so long, right? That in say Western historiographical traditions, you had big land-based territories of empires. And then the maritime world was a story of exploration or maritime history was simply about different kinds of sail configurations and different kinds of anchors and different kinds of ships rations, right? But I think we have come to a point over recent decades where maritime history means something more. And I think if we look, for example, at what we, we see written over the past, say two decades in, in French and English and in Japanese, a lot of these works like Haneda's project on port cities, for example, and now Tansen's new project on port cities, are in a sense putting more boots on land off the deck. We've also got a series of work on riverine systems that especially a number of Japanese colleagues have been more active in, I think recently, sort of starting to move up river until we get to one of the works I mentioned in my presentation, Bojard, who right, who's talking about at different places, you know, Samarkand and, you know, uh, Upper Egypt, right, following those rivers quite far along those kinds of lines, as Tan said mentioned earlier, of cowrie shells going up through uh, Myanmar and up into inland China, right? That there's ways in which a kind of a new maritime history can get beyond the sort of old competition between land and sea. Is it about luxury goods or is it about big bulk commodity trade, for example, for economic historians um, that can put us in a better position, but we need folks like you to make these interventions uh, constantly to make sure that we don't overcorrect from the old land lover historiography. Um, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you, but yeah. Yeah, this is one of the way to, to go beyond the, the shoreline from a maritime perspective. But what we have to think about is, I mean, also, I mean, that's, I mean, that's connection is starting from the uh, maritime sphere to the, uh, the and then go beyond the uh, shoreline, isn't it? Yeah. Then I try. I probably the ultimate. Ultimately, we have to find out in, in the both direction, from a uh, land, and uh, from the land towards the uh, ocean and uh, ocean towards the land. But the, then again, we. I wonder whether this is kind of like. Uh, uh, combination of a two centric history one is viewing from the ocean or one is viewing from the land so yeah. uh, i think actually here's a place where southeast asian studies uh, can make some really interesting contributions right because the the ways in which southeast asians themselves in different languages of the regions have sort of imagine sea in relation to land and, and imagined upstream in relation to downstream already creates a sort of a, a really interesting range of dynamics to think spatially um, moving through the land on water, right? So whether we're talking about, you know, the Mekong getting sucked back up into the Tonle Sap and then back down at different times of the year, or we're talking about the elaborate political arrangements that get made in say in some uh, Indonesian uh, traditional polities, right? With coastal based sultans and highland based chieftains, right? That there might actually be places here where Southeast Asia could provide us some really interesting new conceptual material to think about these kinds of relations. I totally agree with you in the case of Southeast Asia, but if you go to the East, East Africa or Arabian Peninsula, there's no river lines. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I, I understand your point, of course. Yeah. Thank you so much.
Okay. Could Thank I you. ask a question of, of Weixin, actually, if there's nobody else in queue? Well, actually, there are a couple of questions in, oh, in the okay. chat. Uh, if you don't mind, let's let's uh, try to address those uh, first. And then um, I'm going to allow again, uh, the panelists asking each other questions. Uh, I'm going to try to start or select uh, the broader questions first that, that and all of you perhaps can address at, at, at the same time. And in fact, this is one of the questions I had in mind. This comes from Firat Oruk, uh, uh, a faculty member at Georgetown University in Qatar. Um, what is more broadly the current state of Indian Ocean Studies in Southeast and East Asian academia? I think you know this uh, uh, interests uh, what interests a lot of uh, uh, people in our audience here, and broadly uh, speaking as well. So, any one of you could um, address this question. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry, um, I'm going to punt Singapore over to Tansen because I think especially his uh, work on the Nalanda Srivijaya Institute. Um, we did a few things when I was in Singapore as well, but I'll leave that to Tansen. Let me though focus on uh, some new initiatives that we're seeing uh, in Southeast Asia outside of Singapore and especially in Indonesia, for example, where the Directorate General of Culture under the Ministry of Education and Culture last year launched a program called Jalorempa, right? The Spice Roots Program. Now this is a major uh, endeavor coming out of the ministry that's now also uh, created its own private foundation. Um, and they are very actively trying to, to produce not only sort of a new vision of maritime history and heritage for Indonesia, but seeking a number of international partners across the region and across the broader Indian Ocean to try to create a sort of a linked sense of history that can be used for cultural programs, for school curriculum, um, and for uh, long-term sort of document building. And so they're actually one of the many partners we have in the Maritime Asia Heritage Survey. Uh, but they have many other partners who aren't us. And it's a really interesting, I think, move coming from Indonesia to really put an awful lot of resources and thought into thinking about maritime connection. And this is something that is then having sort of effects because of its uh, location within the ministry across a number of government agencies and across uh, universities and uh, institutions of higher education in, in Indonesia. So it's more of a government initiative. I was wondering if um, in any academia in Southeast or East Asia that you're aware of. Tansen, do you want to say something about Sujaya? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I see uh, Andrea Akri is also here on, in the in the participants list. Maybe he wants to join in. But uh, this was uh, the center we established uh, at uh, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies called the Nalanda Srivijaya Center, and, and we looked at uh, Southeast Asia's uh, connections to different parts of the Indian Ocean world and produced number of publications. Uh, including early uh, South Southeast Asian connections through the maritime networks, uh, including archaeological aspects. I would encourage people to look at some of our publications. We also started bringing out a working paper series, which which had fascinating studies uh, of the maritime world, uh, and and this involves scholars not only based in Southeast Asia but China and South Asia, uh, and and so that was mostly a non-governmental. Uh, uh, research taking place on the Indian Ocean activities. Uh, John Mixick, one of the important scholars uh, of Southeast Asia, contributed uh, not only by uh, uh, telling us about Singapore's role in the Indian Ocean connections, but also did archaeological work, including in Indonesia. So uh, I think that uh, place, uh, the Asia Research Institute, where Michael was, uh, also produced a number of studies on the Indian Ocean world. But it's, it's, a, it's not that it's Singapore dominated Southeast Asia, as Michael was pointing out, Indian Ocean, uh, Indonesia has been doing fabulous uh, archaeological work, but in Pasha. Uh, and one of our goals was to get those uh, abstracts translated into English uh, about what people are doing in Indonesia into English so that people can use those. But Cambodia has been doing a lot of research as well. Uh, and I think many of the people know there are shipwrecks uh, in the Indian Ocean, including Vietnam and, and Cambodia, uh, which are important for studying. And I can say for East Asia, uh, the Chinese scholars have been doing a lot of, lot of work. And here uh, we see the influence of UNESCO, uh, the 88 to 
to 97 project, which led to the opening of number of research centers, Indian Ocean Research Centers um, that uh, were started in Fujian and other provinces uh, and museums as well. Uh, some of them were actually state sponsored and, and involved uh, the state narrative, but there are scholars who have been looking at different aspects uh, of the Indian Ocean world. Uh, and I think the same is true of Korea as well. There are a number of people looking at the maritime connections. It's just that we don't have everything put together to see what the state of the field of Indian Ocean studies is uh, in Southeast Asia and, and East Asia. Maybe that's what uh, can be done uh, and, and then brought together in some sort of a database. Uh, Michael, maybe that's something can be part of our joint project to see the state of the field uh, of Indian Ocean studies. Great, thank you. So we've heard that, uh, among other things, Singapore has been uh, the center of knowledge productions about Southeast Asia studies, East Asia studies, Indian Ocean world. Uh, uh, Indonesia has taken a couple of initiatives. There's one question that I really like to um, uh, uh, put out there uh, to all of you guys, uh, which is interesting. This comes from Suitra Wangwari, who is wondering about uh, Thailand in this case where you know, it shares also uh, coastal regions with the Indian uh, Ocean. Uh, is there any significant study or approach uh, to studying Thailand, for example, the religion or, or trade connection with other places uh, along the uh, Indian Ocean littoral as well? Uh, go ahead, Michael, yeah. Uh, you're muted. Michael, you're muted. Michael, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was trying to shut myself up because I don't want to be the only one who's speaking here. Uh, and actually, there are better people to speak about this question. To me, I know that uh, uh, Kumut has had a, a hand up on earlier conversations. She might have more to say. But I think we have seen an awful lot of sort of new work coming out of Thailand, especially archaeology, coastal archaeology. Um, and shipwreck archaeology, maritime archaeology, really looking at from for from a thing that hadn't been done in Thailand an awful lot, a um, uh, sort of the the port, the coastal regions of Thailand, and their uh, role in interregional trade. So, sort of the sort of stuff that we've had for many other parts of Southeast Asia, uh, you know, ceramic analysis and this sort of thing, of looking at sort of trading connections, uh, and some work on religious histories of looking at, for example, the styles of Buddhist statuary and other things like that, that might be able to identify certain streams of religious exchange. But I'm no Thailand expert, and I would move it over to my colleagues uh, to talk a little bit more about that. One thing I think we can say though, is that when we're thinking of Thailand, again, we not only have to think of things that are right on the beach, right? And so for example, there's been a lot of really interesting work on Ayutthaya over the past 15 years or so, as a city significantly upriver to get to some of our early conversations, significantly upriver, that was itself a real maritime power. And so there has been a great deal of really interesting historiography looking at you know, Ayutthaya as a capital of, you know, a Thai Siamese polity, but using some really interesting non-Thai historiographical sources and not just European sources. Uh, so for example, Persian writings about Ayutthaya have gotten increasing attention over the past few years. Uh, and I have a student now uh, that I'm helping to co-supervise just finishing up a PhD in Paris, who's working on a critical edition and a translation of an early 17th century Persian text that yes, mentions Thailand, but not only Thailand. And in fact, has very detailed descriptions of the Indian Ocean world going as far east as Maluku and even the coast of New Guinea. Um, so you have these you know, Persian descriptions of processing sago palm, for example, really interesting. So it, it, the Thailand case also gives us a way of thinking about the kinds of languages and the sorts of choices we make in source material that could bring out really unfamiliar aspects of stories we kind of thought we knew before. Thank you, Michael. On this same note, on this same point, I thought I'd select a question from the chat that is wondering about uh, uh, where Malaysia in, uh, is situated in the study of Indian Ocean world. And I think uh, Wei Xin can can address this particular questions because uh, he talked about this in the anthologies that he was discussing earlier. 
Right, thank you. So uh, as a literary scholar, right, I think that Malaysian literature in English, just the body of text that I work on, does involve the Indian Ocean, but with very specific uh, kinds of communities and diasporas. For example, there is a large body of Malaysian literature in English written by authors of South Asian descent, right? So there you have that Indian Ocean connection without necessarily addressing the entire Indian Ocean world, but the Eastern arc of the Indian Ocean. Right. Uh, there are also, and I think some of my colleagues who are uh, attending can can say uh, more about this uh, longer history, right, of, uh, of of writing in Arabic, right, uh, 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 drawn from the Islamic traditions that are present in Malaysia as well. And then, if you move sort of further down uh, in in terms of moving down the southeastern arc of the Indian Ocean towards Australia, then you have the sort of Malaysian diaspora, right, in Perth, Australia. One thinks of authors like Beth Yang for example, the late Yi Tiang Hong, and also uh, Omar Musa, right? Uh, Omar bin Musa, who is a poet, a spoken word artist, and also a visual woodcut artist as well, right? So again, uh, none of them invoke the Indian Ocean world as a whole, but they focus very much on the sort of uh, inter-regional connections between South Asia, Southeast Asia, and then Southeast Asia and Australia and Oceania. And that's my sense of it, right, right as a scholar of literature. I, my colleagues who work on this, uh, uh, my historian colleagues can probably say more about that too. Yeah, if, if I could add, I think that uh, you are absolutely right. There are earlier phases, you know, some of the earliest Buddhist uh, evidence uh, uh, comes from Malaysia, Keda uh, is an important site, uh, and that uh, Buddhist network that linked Malaysia to what is present in Malaysia to other parts of the Indian Ocean, uh, quite important. And as you mentioned, Islamic uh, connections, uh, architecture moving around from South Asia and Persian Gulf into, into Malaysia. But also the colonial connection, I think is very, very important. Uh, the emergence of Penang, uh, for example, uh, connecting not only India, but also uh, England uh, to, to that place. I think uh, the emergence of some new port cities uh, because of the colonial emergence is, is, I think, quite important. So I think Malaysia fits in quite importantly in different phases and, and different periods. So I, I think most of uh, Southeast Asia fits in, including Burma. We are not talking about uh, the Burmese ports. I think they are uh, very important as well for Indian Ocean connections, links to Sri Lanka, for example, through Buddhist networks, uh, quite important. I think each of these places, uh, I don't think we should individualize these uh, st states, but I think Southeast Asia, both uh, uh, mainland Southeast Asia and maritime South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia are quite connected to the Indian Ocean world. There is a question um, about the limits of language in these studies, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. Um, I'm not quite certain uh, who the question is directed to, uh, but perhaps, um, well, because of the interdisciplinary nature of many of the projects that you're discussing, you can uh, talk a little bit about the role of, of language and the limits of uh, the, the study or, or use of languages in the study of Indian Ocean worlds as well here. Uh, Michael? Yeah, maybe maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say a few things about that. I mean, there's multiple languages. Uh, uh, I mean, it starts with Sanskrit and Pali, uh, goes into uh, earliest uh, uh, ancient Southeast Asian languages as well, but also Chinese. Uh, and it, it becomes, uh, I think Professor Hideki Suzuki would know that world history has the same problem. What kind of languages do you need to do world history? Uh, I mean, usually multiple languages is needed. Yes, uh, I think that's that's an issue, uh, but uh, it's part of the training. I think if you want to do world history, uh, you would need multiple languages and Indian Ocean, if you really want to do the breadth of Indian Ocean uh, and you follow Michael saying that hinterlands are also important. Uh, and, and so you need uh, more than Indian Ocean languages, but it's fascinating to see how people like Amitabh Ghosh is writing about the Indian Ocean using the language of the Laskars, right? I mean, it's not that, uh, uh, that he's looking at the state language, but he's looking at the language that's spoken on the ships. Uh, and so that language I think is also important. Uh, and he found this dictionary of Laskar language and then he worked on that. I mean, so why not also look at the language of the maritime people? 
Uh, so yes, I, I think its language is uh, an essential part, uh, needs to be studied as well. Uh, archaeology, maritime archaeology, underwater archaeology is, is quite important. Uh, I, I think uh, many of these studies need uh, language training, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. Yeah. I am. Um, can I just add, I realized my hand was up there from before, I just never took it down, but, but if I could just add, sir. Um, yeah, because I, I'd like to answer this one, I mean, we've got Amitabh, and I know that Wei Xin wants us to de gauchify Indian Ocean, but even going back to his earlier work on an antique land, right there, he was work, looking at material that's really based on Judeo Arabic, right? Again, one another, another one of these non state languages that demands an awful lot of very uh, specialized technical skill to be able to make sense of, but which can open up a huge uh, new view onto Indian Ocean history, as we've recently seen in Elizabeth Lamborn's. Uh, brilliant new book, uh, Abraham's Luggage. Um, I'd like to see if we can jump forward. There's a question from Sean McKee in the, in the uh, queue for questions that actually I think links to this. Uh, and he asks, um, the history of the Indian Ocean varies in geographic shores as well as through time, along with players involved, be they China, the Portuguese or whomever. What would be the common themes that the panel identifies as perhaps universal? Um, I won't speak for the panel, but I did kind of maybe open myself up for the shot at the end with that uh, quote from Geertz about parochial facts and broad principles. And one of the things I would say, at least for my work, uh, that the Indian Ocean as a region itself provides a really interesting sort of integrated lab to study is the process of vernacularization. Right, that is the process by which sort of regions uh, or traditions, cultural traditions with trans-regional aspirations get people from far different, uh, far flung places to somehow invest in them and to use these uh, high traditions as ways to remake their own identity in relationship to others. And I think if we think about that broad notion of vernacularization as it was sort of really redefined for us all by Pollock, uh, we can begin to see the ways in which Chinese and Indic and Arabo-Persian and uh, later European traditions provided new sort of cosmopolitan options in which people worked out a really wide range of vernacular responses. And here I would say not just in the form of language, uh, but also you can think of this vernacular template as something animating uh, material culture. And in fact, while I was speaking earlier, I noticed a message popped up on my screen, sorry for the plug, that a new article that my colleagues and I from Aceh and Singapore have just published on the vernacularization of Islam in 15th century Sumatra is just out published. And to answer the, the online question for it is also open access. So I can share the link if anybody wants it. Speaking about open access, um, there's a question actually from our convener, Phoebe, who uh, is wondering, uh, will the Maritime Asia Heritage Survey remain open access um, considering perhaps the cost of maintaining it uh, will increase over time as you put more digitized or digital uh, materials into the database. I guess that one's for me as well. Yeah, I sent a, a quick message to Phoebe. Yeah, as I mentioned before, working with Arcadia, because this notion about open access is so important, this actually becomes one of the points for establishing the working relationships with our host universities and getting the grant. And so we've, in a sense, tried to, rather than doing what many grants do, which is put all the stuff up online and then freak out about what to do after the grant period, before we were able to receive the money for the grant, we already had to negotiate different ways of providing for this long-term open access, as well as the long-term uh, archival presentation that I talked about a few moments ago. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is from our convener, Phoebe, and this time for Tansen. Um, uh, she's interested in, in the linkages between the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, confusion centers at different institutions of higher education in Africa and the extent to which he, uh, you think you know, will contribute to the Indian, Indian Ocean World Studies in the future? Yeah, I, I think the Confucius Institutes are separate. It started uh, earlier than the Belt and Road Initiative, but uh, a part of the Belt and Road Initiative that I think might contribute to the Indian Ocean 
connections and this is to promote uh, the, the China-based uh, uh, notion of Indian Ocean connections is the archaeological expeditions that they are sponsoring in different places, especially in the eastern coast of uh, Africa and Kenya, for example. Uh, they are uh, sponsoring various archaeological digs to find the connections that might have existed in the early 15th century, and they have excavated lots of very, very interesting and important porcelain shards. Um, but uh, they are trying to do it in other places as well, Sri Lanka being one of them. Uh, so part of this Belt and Road Initiative is not just a contemporary economic agenda, but it's also to make sure that the Belt and Road Initiative has a long history. So they are creating this history or trying to create the history through archaeological diggings. So I think if, if those kinds of archaeological digs and, and you know China has a lot of money to sponsor these kinds of activities, I think that may be an important contribution. The issue with that is how do you interpret the data, right? I mean, who are the people interpreting the data and how much there was a question about open access. Will people be allowed to look at this, this these findings and come to their own conclusions uh, is the issue. And then one of the problems that uh, we are encountering is uh, suddenly people come up and say that we were the descendants of Cheng He. Uh, who, by the way, was a eunuch. Uh, but uh, these kinds of things which are promoted in China to showcase uh, the antiquity or, or uh, long history of China's uh, maritime tradition could be a problematic historical narrative. Uh, and, and this suddenly goes with the Cheng He narrative, which has become so state-focused that uh, any criticism of Cheng He is seen as anti-patriotic. Anti uh, so what do you do with that kind of, of a narrative that is being established through uh, the investment projects? And, and I would say, Phoebe, uh, the, the criticism of these projects is, is similar to the criticism of Confucius Institute when a China-focused narrative is promoted uh, through these Confucius Institutes. So yes, there may be more archaeological digs, but what do you do with those digs uh, and how you interpret them uh, would be an issue that we should be uh, careful about. Thank you. Um, there is one question. Uh, Michael is already uh, starting to type the answer, but I think uh, it would be worth uh, saying it out loud um, from one of the attendees. Expanding the part of the Arabic document or manuscripts available in Southeast Asia, as well as those documented in the Maldives, 90% of these documents are religious texts. Um, and they're meant for Islamic uh, education purposes instead of for recording history. Um, uh, I'd appreciate if any of the panelists can comment how we can extract or approach these documents in constructing live experience and social history of the people. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. I'm sorry, I feel like I've talked way over my quota tonight. Um, just a couple of things is yes, an awful lot of these are um, religious documents and among those, an awful lot of them are the Quran. Uh, but we can actually find quite a bit of interesting material if we look at these texts uh, from some different angles. One thing, for example, even in Quran manuscripts, I know that Annabel Gallup, for example, at the British Library has been doing some really interesting work of looking at the conventions of styles of Arabic calligraphy and styles of ornamentation, uh, illumination on the page, of the ways in which that shows connections in different styles across different parts of the Indian Ocean world where they move at different times, right? So finding sort of overlaps and connections and slight innovations in the kinds of, say, uh, illuminate, illumination frameworks around Quranic verses. So there's things you can do there. You can do things there with colophons, for example, the bits at the end of the Arabic uh, text that go down like little triangles that say often where it's copied. Very often there you can, well, not very often, but sometimes if you're lucky there, you can find the names and the places where certain texts were copied and then sometimes see the names of scribes and mentions of their teachers that can again connect somebody say in a place in Tamil Nadu with a place in, in Sumatra, for example. Uh, you can also look at the kinds of non-Quranic religious texts that get copied, right? That is, are there certain kinds of texts that are associated with say certain Sufi orders that we can find in different parts of the country at different times. And do they change over time? That, for example, we had an awful lot of Shatari texts and then a century passes and we have an awful lot of Naqshbandi texts, for example. So they can show broad patterns of religious change. 
And in my own first field of Islamic law, we can actually find some really interesting things in Islamic legal manuscripts, especially in collections of fatwas and rulings that will show, in a sense, legal decisions that are, at least in theory, supposed to be responding to necessities in everyday life. Right, So all kinds of aspects about what are permissible and what are forbidden commodities, what are per, uh, uh, permissible and forbidden forms of contract, and what kinds of people you can have different kinds of contract with can actually give you some really interesting insights for the nuts and bolts of how interactions might have worked in particular times and places. Great. Well, we're way uh, past the uh, hour uh, uh, that we uh, uh, have allocated for this webinar, uh, but thank you so much for your participations and your answers, all, all the questions. I'm going to uh, now turn it over to Phoebe again uh, for her closing remarks. Well, thank you, Anto, for moderating the discussion. So it's very, very nice to have you here. And I'd like to say, start with a thanks to our panelists. Um, I know you feel that you probably have not um, given us the most nuanced feel of historiography in Southeast Asia or East Asia or even the state of literature. But I think we had a really good start here. And if you ever get round to you know, writing it, whether it's for literature or history, uh, we should definitely meet here and discuss. Because I think sometimes in fields, um, this also has a, 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 a creates a loop. You, know, you write about the state of the field and other people feel, well, they missed this and they missed that. Or why don't we collaborate on A, B, C, and E? So uh, I think we had a really good uh, discussion. Thank you so very much for joining us. My thanks to the audience as well for your great uh, questions. And I also should not uh, miss thanking Qatar Foundation and Georgetown University in Qatar for supporting this uh, uh, gathering and gatherings in the past. I also want to acknowledge Zubat Shakir. Zubat Shakir works with the events team at Georgetown and she's the one who has coordinated and provided IT support for this particular webinar. And it's also psychologically comforting for someone like me who is not good with technology. And she, we cannot see her, but she's been here throughout. And then I would also like to um, say thank you to a teacher of mine, Dr. Edward Alpers, who quite a number of people on the panel know. You know, you may not know this, but the journey to this webinar started several years ago when I was his um, uh, advisee, he was my doctoral um, mentor. And I was working as a student uh, research assistant on one of his Madagascar projects. And if you know a little bit about the history of Madagascar, you know that uh, the population, or at least a large percentage of that country's population has antecedents in Indonesia. So working on that project got me really thinking a lot more concretely about um, Southeast Asia and East Asia in the Indian Ocean world. Prior to that, I was very, you know, Western Indian Ocean focused. So uh, hopefully this will be a beginning for continued engagement so that even as we um, proceed with our Western Indian Ocean focus in this particular part of the world, we will reach out to the Eastern Indian Ocean over time. So my thanks to the panelists, my thanks to Georgetown, Qatar Foundation, Zubash, and of course, Anto Moxin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, Zubash. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a good rest of the day. Bye.